Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from one of our special guests. All right, so we're going to get into the Word of God. We're talking about developing a loyal heart. And um, there's been a number of messages. Pastor Dan has preached this morning. He preached on, you know, a solid rock faith. And then last Sunday, I believe it was, he preached on having a true heart. And I believe God is kind of speaking that into the, into the life of the congregation. Um, we conduct video Bible schools. We have about 17,000 of these schools all over the world. We're in 146 nations, the International School of Ministry. And, um, you know, very often I do graduations around the world, and I say, look, we can teach you the Bible. We can teach you about, you know, serving God. We can teach you about prayer, about worship. We can teach you a lot of different things by giving you instruction in the Bible. But there's one thing you can't teach somebody, and that's how to have a loyal heart. That is something which, which you pursue. That's something which you go after. It's something which is extremely precious. It's a, it's a decision in your heart to say, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to serve you with all my heart. So the scripture that has been challenging me and really been speaking into my heart comes from First Chronicles chapter 16 and, uh, and verse 9. And um, it's actually uh, from Second Chronicles 16 verse 9. And I'm going to lay some context. I'd like us to put the actual scripture up um, to just start with. And God speaks us to a king of Israel and says these words. He says, For the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. So we're actually going to skip down in the notes so that we can just go to that scripture. 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Now I'm going to lay some grounding for that, but I want you to understand the basis of this scripture is that God's eyes are going all over the earth. So God is actually searching the entire planet looking for equality in a human heart. And it says the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of someone whose heart is loyal to him. Now we're going to look at the context of this in a, in a moment. But when I, one of the first things that I know is I want God to show himself strong on my behalf. How many of you want God to do miracles in your life? How many of you want to see His power? How many of you want to see God show up and show Himself strong in your behalf? Amen? So, number one, I want whatever the, the quality or the qualification is for the Scripture, I want that in my life. Secondly, God is looking for this. This isn't just sort of a thing, well, maybe if you've got it, you've got it. There's, a, there's an active search in the heart of God to seek out people. And we know that from little King David when, you know, God's looking for a new king for Israel. And the Bible says that God's searching throughout all the people of Israel. And he, he alights on this little shepherd boy. This little shepherd boy that's worshiping God. And he sees, it says that David was a man after God's own heart. It was a man whose heart was fully belonged to God. And God takes this kid from a, from a sheepfold and anoints him and says, that's my choice for the next king. See, God didn't look at your, the qualifications of people, how many years of military experience or any of those things. God looked for one quality, loyalty of heart. Amen? So I want us just to explore this, allow the Holy Spirit to speak into your life because I believe if we can find this quality... And if you can pursue it, because I believe you can get this quality, that this is the secret to God's power. This is the secret to God showing up on your behalf. This is the secret to God really using your life and doing something great with it. Amen? Amen. Now, the, the, the history of this actual story is not that encouraging in the sense that when God speaks this to King Asa, it's kind of at the end of you know, an entire um, two or three chapters telling about his life. This, is a, this was one of the godliest kings of Israel. He, when he was a young, young man, he, he served God. And we'll actually just read 
what happened in, in chapter 14 at the beginning of his reign, 2 Chronicles chapter 14, we read about this king who God spoke this word to. And this is now maybe 30 years earlier, we are now picking up the story of King Asa. And it says that, that after he you know, became king, in verse 9, it says of 2 Chronicles 14, Then Zerah, the Ethiopian, came out against them with an army of a million men and 300 chariots. And he came to Marasha. So Asa went out against them, and they set the troops in battle array in the valley of Zephathah at Marasha. And Asa cried out to the Lord his God and said, Lord, it is nothing for you to help whether with many or with those who have no power. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on you, and in your name we go against this multitude. O Lord, you are our God. Do not let man prevail against you. So the Lord struck the Ethiopians before Asa and Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. And Asa and the people who were with him pursued them to Gerar, so the Ethiopians were overthrown. They could not recover, for they were broken before the Lord and his army. And they carried away very much spoil. Amen? So this king started out with a heart that was just, I mean, a million people came against him and he cried out to God and God destroyed the army. Now, he had peace after that war, up until the 35th reign, year of his reign. And I mean, he was, he was prospering, he built cities, he did great things, and this young king who had served God and had such a whole heart towards God became wealthy, became prosperous, he, he, he you know, became influential, did great things. Now in the 35th year of his reign, it says actually the 36th year, we pick the story up now in 2 Chronicles chapter, 14, chapter 16 actually. In the 36th year of the reign of Asa, Baasha king of Israel came up against Judah and built Ramah that he might let none go out or come in to King Asa of Judah. So now we have a foreign king who comes in, and he now is a threat to the kingdom of Asa. Then Asa brought silver and gold from the treasuries of the house of the Lord and the king's house, and sent them to Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, who dwelt in Damascus, saying, Let there be a treaty between you and me, as there was between my father and your father. See, I've sent you silver and gold. Come break your treaty with Basha, king of Israel, so that he will withdraw from me. So Ben-Hadad heeded King Asa and sent the captains of his armies against the cities of Israel. Now when, a when it happened, when Basha, in verse 5, now it happened when Basha heard it that he stopped building Ramah and ceased his work. Now, a problem comes up in the kingdom. And King Asa, instead of trusting God like he did when he was young, and when he was, you know, facing the Ethiopians, he now comes up with a natural solution. He comes up with a financial solution. He takes silver and gold. He takes it and he, he solves it. In fact, if you read this whole story, he solves the problem. He's got a king coming against him. He hires another king. That guy breaks his treaty. And now the problem's solved. They stop building the city that was a problem. And everything in the natural is a natural solution and it's a natural result. And actually in the natural, it seems like the problem's been solved. You see, this happens a lot to us as we grow in God. We start off and we're facing every opposition and we just cry out to God and we trust Him with everything in our being. And then you know what? God blesses us and helps us and we, you know, we just begin to trust just slowly more and more in our natural thinking, in our natural resources, in natural things that, you know, that our natural strength, our natural everything, we slowly begin to move and it looks the same and it seems like we can solve the problems, but not in the eyes of God. Because the one quality that God is searching and looking for. So after he's done this, he solved the problem. Now we pick up the story in verse number seven. And at that time, Hanani the seer came to King Asa, or to Asa king of Judah, said to him, Because you've relied on the king of Syria, you've not relied on the Lord your God, therefore the army of the king of Syria has escaped from your hand. Were the Ethiopians and the Lubim not a huge army and with many chariots and horsemen, yet because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand? 
And now comes the famous, famous scripture. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Now, this word loyal means shalem. It's a Hebrew word, and it's pronounced sholem. It's translated complete, safe, peaceful, perfect, whole, and full. I'll give you some of the other translations. That, it, that same word loyal is blameless, entire. They're complete, um, just, perfect, prepared, whole, wholeheartedly, and wholly devoted. You see, the word for loyal is actually the word for wholeness. It's for fullness. It's a full trust in God. You know, I love it when Pastor Jim gives an altar call here. And he basically says, look, it's not one step in, one step out. I remember when I was a young kid and I grew up in an Anglican church in Africa. And an African um, preacher, this was back in the 70s, came um, from Uganda. And he, and he was sharing about, you know, coming to a big city for the first time. And he talked about, you know, uh, going to London. And for the first time in his life, he came across an escalator. Now, if you've never seen an escalator, and, you, and it's your first encounter with one, it's a pretty scary entity, you know? It's kind of this moving stairway, this moving staircase that's, you know, you've never used one before, you want to try. And he made the mistake of just putting one foot on the escalator. That's a mistake. You see, you can't put one foot on an escalator. It's all or nothing, all right? And... And this is the way it is in the kingdom. When Pastor Jim gives an altar call, he says, look, this is an all or nothing relationship with God. It's, it's a whole heart. It's everything. And Asa had started like that. But somehow, over the time, and when God sends a seer to him, the Lord says, God's eyes go to and fro. And he's looking for a heart that stays in that place, that stays in a wholehearted commitment to God. A few other versions, a New American Standard says the following, The eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the whole earth that He may strongly support those whose heart is completely His. Another one, the Dawi Reims Bible says, For the eyes of the Lord behold all the earth and give strength to those who with a perfect heart trust in Him. And we see the same thing that this... It, it carries the meaning of serving God with a sincere heart, a covenant-keeping heart, a single-mindedness, a loyal devotion. It also conveys the clear idea of serving God with all your heart, with full love, with full loyalty, and full integrity. We did a, a teaching with Dr. Jack Hayford, and he does a, one teaching on the ISOM in our, tele, in, our, in our video Bible school on integrity. You know, and we think of integrity, we think of a person who, you know, who's righteous and upright. He said the word integrity comes from the word integer. It's a whole number. It's not a fraction. It's never a part. He talks about going into a, a, a place that sells, you know, sliced meat into a butcher shop. And you know that they take out the big piece of ham and they just sliver off just a tiny little bit. And when they put it back in, it looks exactly the same as it was. But it's been compromised by just a sliver. And he talked about integrity being not allowing any part of your heart to be sliced off. Not allowing any part of it to be, you know, somehow compromised. Somehow the wholeness of that, of that ham had to remain. And the wholeness of our heart cannot be, even by a sliver, allowed to be sliced off. Amen? You know, a few um, months ago, back in, I think, January or February... We're very blessed in about a month's time, just over a month's time, we're going to have here at The Rock, uh, Reinhard Bonk is going to be coming to minister on a Wednesday night service here on October 1st. And it's a tremendous, um, I mean, to me, uh, this is going to be an enormous, um, to us, blessing, privilege, and honor to have him here. He's probably one of the greatest evangelists the world has um, right now, next to Dr. Billy Graham some of those other great people. But Reinhard Bunker, um, to me, carries a passion for souls, carries a heart for the nations like, like, like nobody else we know. Lisa and I worked for four and a half years for Reinhard. We traveled all over the world together. My oldest daughter was dedicated to God by, by him. And there was a tremendous uh, season of our lives. We lived in Frankfurt, Germany, and Lisa and I 
We probably worked 16, 18 hour days, many, many days. We served Reinhardt's vision and his ministry. We would go into Africa and we would document miracles and healings and we've seen blind eyes open and cripples get healed and I was his TV producer so I got to actually interview families. Lisa was the journalist and she got to go and, and speak to the mothers and the fathers and, and to document astounding miracles, astounding healings. And then to go back, we went back into Kenya after a man had you know, being healed who was deaf and dumb from birth. He was over 40 years old and he had learned to speak after nine months and he was able to tell us what it was like to live as a deaf and dumb person his entire life. And, you know, so we documented these amazing miracles and, and, and Lisa and I remember that, you know, with all of our hearts, we served the vision that Reinhardt had. And it was probably one of the most difficult things. We did two 10-day fasts before God, you know, moved us on and and, I, and I, it was such a difficult thing for me because I loved Reinhardt, loved his ministry, but the Lord said, I've called you to help the pastors. I've, I've called you to help the shepherds. So our ministry is actually called Good Shepherd Ministries International. And, and our heart is to help pastors to disciple all those people getting saved from these big crusades. Amen? And so, you know, but we remember those years and, and, and it took two 10-day fasts and then when I finally had to tell Reinhardt it was only because God told me I have to go on and I have to do the will of God for my life. It was a heartbreaking decision, heartbreaking moment when I, and God gave me the day to tell him and he told, he said on the 12th of December in 1988, the Lord said, that's the day you have to tell Ryan. It was the end of a crusade in Ghana and I sat down with him and it was just, it was such an emotional experience to say, Reinhard, God's calling me to help the pastors. And, and Reinhard, you know, has over the years, he's, he, he participated in our International School of Ministry, and we've kept a good relationship with him. But I hadn't spoken to him maybe in six or eight years. And in February this year, there was a phone call came into our office, and my assistant, uh, Deborah, came in. She's, she put the phone call to her first before it came through to me. She said, I just want to hear how, how he sounds. So she takes the call, and she says, Reinhard Bonker's on line one, or whatever it was, and I'm... I, I pick up the phone and, you know, it was almost instantaneous like I was back there with him. It was such an instant connection. And we talked for about 15 minutes. He talked about having a heart to do legacy impartation. And I invited him to come to The Rock to do a legacy impartation service here where he would impart a passion for souls and an anointing to reach the lost onto this congregation and to all these delegates we're bringing from around the world. And it was just a beautiful conversation. The presence of God was so strong. And the end of the conversation, Reinhardt said, you know, Baron, he said, you know, I have a, a person who's come to me and they, they want to sow into minist a ministry and they wanted to remain anonymous and your, your ministry came to my heart. He said, this person wants to sow $50,000 into your ministry. And he said, I recommended you. And... Now, you may think that's it's an enormous amount. Maybe it, it, it's about 10 days worth of expenses in our ministry. So it wasn't the amount. It was the fact that 24 years after serving him, that of all the ministries that he would think about sowing back into, that our ministry would come to his heart. Because there's something about when you serve even man and serve people with a wholeness of heart, with a full integrity, with a full, you know, a, a, a heart that is, that is not divided, it's not in any way, with a loyalty that is a loyalty from God, that God, 24 years later, would reward it with that phone call. And him coming now to the rock to now impart that legacy anointing into this congregation and into our people. Amen? Give the Lord a hand. Amen? Loyalty is an incredibly powerful concept. It's an incredibly powerful, um, you know, it, it, it's something which, which touches the heart of people. There's an interesting scripture in the book of Proverbs. I'm just going to read this one line. It's very, very simple. Proverbs 19.22 says, Loyalty makes a person attractive. Now, ladies, this is, this is for you. <laughs> a loyal heart... All right, and we're going to look at some of the connections of this word is more attractive, you know, than these beautiful eyes or a chiseled chin or whatever. 
Loyalty will make a person more attractive than anything else. Because there's something about the quality of a loyal heart that's, that's, that just touches our hearts. Um, I came across, you know, and many of you may have seen the movie, but when we were in Japan a, a few years ago, we actually went to past the Eddie Alguera, we went and did a skateboard outreach in Tokyo. And we took um, Pastor Eddie, who's a you know, world champion skateboarder, and we went into the, in the downtown areas of Tokyo where these, tra these train stations are, and we actually did all kinds of outreaches, and we, we did the skateboarding stuff, and then we, people gathered in a crowd, and we preached the gospel to them. Well, in one of the stations, we came across a statue of a dog, all right? And I'll just give you the brief history of this dog. It's called Hachito, Hach Hachiko. It's at Tokyo Sibuyu Station. Now, this dog in, in, in the history of, Jap of Japan, it used to meet its master at a certain spot at that station every evening when he came back from work. His master, his name was Pro Professor Yuno, and he was a professor of agriculture at the University of Tokyo. And one day, maybe about three years after this dog, every day would meet him, while he was at work, he had a brain hemorrhage, and he actually died at work. He never returned home after that day, but for the next nine years, every day at five o'clock in the evening, whatever time that train would normally arrive, for nine years, that dog would stay at that one location and watch that train come in looking for its master for nine years until it died. And there have been two movies made out of that story. And three bronze statues have been erected in different places in Japan. And that movie's even gone across into Hollywood. And, and, and uh, Richard Gere was a part of the movie here about the same concept of that story. But something about loyalty and a loyal heart has the capacity to touch the heart of God and to touch other people's hearts in a way that nobody, nothing else can. There's something about this quality of a loyal heart. And so, I want us to look at that word of, of, of loyalty. Um, the word in Proverbs um, 20, verse 28. And we want to look at, at the, whole, the whole situation is, um, we want to, we'll just go, the, the actual word means kindness and mercy and covenant loyalty. So I want you to connect. This word loyalty in Scripture is connected with kindness and with mercy and covenant loyalty. Those three concepts are interconnected all the way through Scripture. And it's the kindness like what the rock does to reach the poor. It's the kindness which is the goodness of God. That word is actually the same word that is used in, 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 in loving kindness, and it's the ex a kindness to extends to the poor. It's a kindness that reaches out and touches people and gives mercy. We'll actually go to Genesis chapter 24, verse 12. Let's pick it up there. It says, O Lord God, my master Abraham, give me success this day and show kindness to my master Abraham. This was when the servant of Abraham went to go and find a wife for it's Abraham's son Isaac. And he prays and says, God, let your covenant mercy guide me and help me to get a wife for, for your son. So he uses it in that context. You see, God has a covenant mercy towards us and a covenant loyalty to us. And God has this quality and we can actually, you know, believe God, that covenant loyalty that God will manifest it because we're in covenant with God. Amen? And so that mercy of heaven can be released to us. We see it again in Genesis 39 with the story of Joseph. It says, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him covenant loyalty or mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. So because Joseph was in a prison, he was crying out to God, God, show me covenant mercy, covenant loyalty. And this word covenant loyalty is what caused the keeper of the prison to show kindness to this, to Joseph in prison. It appears 247 times. It's pronounced uh, chesed, the word for loyalty or covenant loyalty, and it's used 247 times in the Old Testament. 
Now, just these two other scriptures or three other scriptures that are very, very interesting. We read in Proverbs 21, 21, whoever pursues righteousness and covenant loyalty or unfailing love or mercy will find life, righteousness, and honor. Now, look at those words there. Whoever pursues righteousness and unfailing love will find righteousness and honor. That word righteousness and unfailing love is covenant loyalty, which means you can pursue this. It's something you can pursue and you will find life, righteousness, and honor. How many of you want this quality in your life? Amen? We want to have this quality of loyalty. Hosea 6.6, 6, God says to the children of Israel, I desire mercy, covenant loyalty, and not sacrifice. God says to the whole nation of Israel, don't bring me bulls and goats. I'm not after that. That's not, I don't want your sacrifices. I want covenant loyalty. I want mercy. The word mercy there is covenant loyalty. Amen? Amen. God says, that's what I'm looking for. He says, I'm, I, and I want the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. See, God says, I don't want sacrifices. I want covenant loyalty. And then in, verse, in Proverbs 20, verse 28, mercy or covenant loyalty and truth preserve the king. And by loving kindness or covenant loyalty, he upholds his throne. One more in, in the amplified version, loving kindness and mercy, truth and faithfulness preserve the king. It's the same verse. His throne is upheld by the people's loyalty. So the loyalty of people is what upholds the throne of a king. It's something which God wants in every person's heart. I'm just going to touch on David and Jonathan. They had a covenant between each other. And there was, they, they made a covenant as, as, as friends. They were very close with each other. David and Jonathan made a covenant with each other that was bound and connected with covenant loyalty. Now, if you go through the whole history of what happened with David, at the time that they made their covenant, Jonathan's father was the king, King Saul. David was running for his life. But they made a covenant together. And the situation now, many years later, completely, it shifted, it changed. And what happened was that David became king. Jonathan and Saul were killed. And now David's ruling the throne of, of Israel. And David basically says, is there a, a child of Jonathan alive? He says, I want to show him covenant loyalty. And he takes that man, Mephibosheth, and he puts him at his, at his table. And this guy, he's lame in his feet. He feels like he's about to be killed because, you know, he's the son of the enemy. And he thinks he's going to be destroyed. David says, no, I'm going to show you covenant loyalty. You're going to sit at my table. You're going to, for, you're going to forever, I'm going to restore all the land of your grandfather. Everything that you're supposed to have, I'm giving it back to you. And I'm going to restore covenant loyalty. I'm going to show covenant loyalty to you. Everything is yours, and you're going to eat as one of my sons at my table. Because I made a covenant with your father. Amen? Amen. There's something about that to me that touches my heart. Just speaking about Reinhardt. Now we've gotten two sort of, con we've got concepts going here where this covenant loyalty is something we talked about as a wholeness. It's a whole heart. It's a whole, uh, uh, it's a whole attitude towards God. And when we were with Reinhard, we, we, we loved his stories. Reinhard used to tell amazing stories. And he speaks in parables. He speaks to huge African crowds. And he always, and I'm just going to tell you one of the stories that, that to me goes along with what we're sharing that to me really illustrates this concept and how we, we get, how do we get a wholeness of heart and how do we get covenant loyalty. He told, always told, it's a parable about a man who owned a house and the house had 10 rooms inside the house and there were five rooms upstairs and five rooms downstairs. And the man who owned the house was, you know, you know, was going about his business every day. And one day there was a knock at the door and it was Jesus. Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And, and uh, can I come in? And the man said, oh, absolutely, Jesus. He, uh, you know what? He says, Jesus, 
I'm going to give you the very best room at the house. He says, there's, a, there's, the, there's the master suite upstairs. Jesus, you can have that, that room. So Jesus is a gentleman, and Jesus says, okay, and he goes up, and he goes into his room. Well, that night, there's another knock at the door, and it's the devil. The man's terrified, and he goes to the door, and, and, and he, he just opens it just a fraction, but the devil puts his foot in the door, and then that man is fighting all night long, fighting with filthy thoughts, fighting with all kinds of just... I mean, terrible ideas, things just going. He, he's warring with lust. He's warring with every kind of addiction and everything. That, and, and he finally in the morning just gets the devil out of the house. And he thinks, my goodness, I fought this the whole night. And where was Jesus? So he goes up to Jesus and Jesus says, you know, where were you? The devil visited me in the night. Now, you know, why, why didn't you help me? Jesus says, well, you know, of all the 10 rooms in the house, you just gave me one room. I just stayed in my room. So the man says, no, I'm so sorry, Jesus. says, we're going to just it's split the house. You take the upstairs, I'll take the downstairs. Well, again, that night, now the devil comes again, and he somehow breaks in. And, and again, the guy's fighting the whole time, day and night, just fighting. I mean, he just cannot, he, he wars and he, until he's absolutely exhausted. And finally, he kicks the devil out, and now he's just really upset. goes back upstairs, Jesus you know what, I, the devil visited again and I had all of these, these terrible thoughts and terrible attacks and I'm fighting all this stuff and where were you? And Jesus says to him, listen, says, why didn't you just give me the whole house? Why didn't you just, you know, give me the keys and give me every, every room? And instead of me staying with you, why didn't you stay with me? Amen? So the next night, about to go to bed, and there's a terrible knock on the door. And again, the devil's at, at the front door, and the guy just is terrified, wants to go and hide. And, and, he, and he, you know, he's just absolutely beside himself and just thinking, how am I going to fight the devil again? And suddenly he hears these giant footsteps coming down. And Jesus doesn't just go and open the door a little bit. He fling open, flings open the door. And the devil looks at him and says, Excuse me, sir, I'm so sorry. I knocked at the wrong door. Amen? You see, there's something about giving God every room of the house. Because some of us, we give God nine rooms. Sometimes nine rooms in a closet or nine rooms in a half. All right? But maybe on that last room, we've got maybe, you know, maybe the pornography's in room number 10. Maybe, you know, illicit, uh, partaking of some illicit drug or gambling or some vice or something. And we don't quite want to give every last room to him because we, maybe we enjoy what's in that last room. But you know what? Until you give every room into the house, of every of your house into the kingdom of God and give it over to Jesus you will always fight the enemy and you'll always have a margin not of not having victory because when you give it all when you give the whole house and the whole room to him then he has to answer the door remember the owner of the house has to answer the door amen so give it all to him I'm just going to close with just giving you three areas of loyalty that we need, to, we need to always have. Number one, we always have to maintain a loyalty with God. Even Job, the worst case of his scenario, he said, God, and even if you slay me, I'll still trust you. No matter what happens in my life, I will put my trust in you. All right? And that comes from Job uh, chapter 13, verse 15. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. We see David versus Goliath. The D David is a little kid he, facing a huge giant, and he's like, you know what? I trust God. You may be trusting in your, in your javelin, in your spear, in your armor, but I'm trusting in the living God. We, Abraham offering Isaac. We see, we see him just, you know, not knowing how the story's going to pan out. We, do, we see it in hindsight, but Abraham had to put his, his son on the altar. But he said, God, I trust you. Even if you raise my son from the dead, you will fulfill your word. And God 
you know, is our first love. He is the one that we have to trust. And we can't start trusting him, then get a bunch of stuff, and then he's going to test us. He tested Abraham. The Bible says he is testing the loyalty of Abraham. God will always test your loyalty. He always tests, well, where are you putting your trust? Is it in the doctor? It's not that we don't believe in doctors, but even if we visit a doctor, we're still trusting in God with our whole heart. Our lives belong to Him. Every house, every room in our house is His. And you have to come to the place where you're willing to give that over. Amen? We see Jesus on the cross with everything against Him and every single opposition, every demon in hell probably screaming at Him. And with all of the people that deserted Him and His disciples mostly left Him, and Jesus is there and he's hanging and he's into, into your hands, God, I commit my spirit. You can read his prayer in Psalm 22 where he cries out to God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he says, I learned to trust on my mother's womb and my, my mother's breasts. I, I trusted you. I learned from a very a baby to trust the living God. And you can see that Jesus put his entire life completely in the hands of God and trusted whatever the outcome God would be in control. Amen? And there's something about that quality that God will never not show up. Amen? You may say, what's the way out? I'm telling you the way out is a complete trust in God. It's not a 90% or an 87% or a 93%. It's a wholehearted trust in Him. It's a covenant loyalty to God. We need to also trust in the people that, where God is moving. We have to discern what God's doing and where He's at. Where is He, where is he moving? I, 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 I put my whole heart behind the freedom for our future because I know God's in this house. I know God's anointed this house. I know God's called this house. And there's a trust that I can put in this. When I was with Reinhard Bonker, I remember in a crusade in Malawi, I remember just worshiping God, and I remember... As I was there, I was reluctant. I'm thinking I'm going to be going into Africa, these dangerous countries, and people throwing tear gas bombs at us, and we're going to Islamic areas. And, and, my, and I was concerned about it, and I felt the Holy Spirit speak to me and say, you can trust my leadership through Reinhard Bonke. From that time onwards, I was able to trust that God was in control and that He would guide the leadership that I was under and I was under the covering of. And to me, having a heart to serve even this house and to serve what God's doing in this place is a tremendous, when you put yourself under that covering, there's a, there's a covenant loyalty that God blesses you with. Because you come under the blessing of the house. You partake of the anointing of the house. You partake of the healing in the house. You partake of the salvation in this house. You partake of all that God has given into this house when you join your heart to it. Amen? Amen. Ruth says... The following to Naomi. Now you understand Ruth when she says to Naomi, she's, she's coming from a broken place. And I felt that this message tonight was for people who maybe have become a little cynical. Maybe, you know, they've been wounded. Maybe they've been betrayed. Maybe they've been hurt some. And their hearts have, have really sort of been wounded and, and come to a place where it's difficult for them to completely trust. And God wants to restore a whole heart to you. Because Naomi comes to Ruth and says, listen, your, your husband's died. You must remember the story here is that they go to the country of Moab. The two sons marry wives. The husband is there in Moab and the husband dies. Then the first son dies. Then the second son dies. And now Naomi, the mother, is left. She says to the two wives, she says, listen, go back to your people don't come with me. Everything in my world's falling apart. Everything else has been damaged. Everything's broken. My husband's died. My son's died. My other son's died. I'm going back to Israel. And the one wife says, okay, I'm heading back to my people. But Ruth, she says the following. She says, it says they lifted up their eyes. Let's pick it up in verse 11. Ruth 1 verse 11. Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why do you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb? That they may be your husbands. Turn back, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. They lifted up their voices and wept again. Orpah is the other wife, kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. 
And she said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you or to go back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also. If anything but death parts you and me. Hundred heart loyalty. She wasn't just being loyal to a person. She was being loyal to the covenant of God that was resting upon Naomi. Despite her circumstances, despite that everything was broken, despite that they'd lost husbands and wives and their wives had lost husbands, despite all of those things, there there was a loyalty of heart to the covenant of God that was upon the nation of Israel. And Ruth said, I'm not, going to stop, I'm not going to stop serving you. I'm not going to stop being with you. I'm not going to stop loving you. I'm not going to stop you know, going with you. I will go where you go and your God will be my God. Amen. You know what? God looked upon that situation. He looked into the future and he took that woman and put that woman into the lineage of Christ. And that woman is the one who gave birth to the great... She was the great-great-grandmother of King David. And the lineage of King David and the lineage of Jesus came from Ruth. It came from a heart of loyalty. Because remember, the eyes of the Lord will go to and fro throughout the whole earth, and God will show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Are you with me, church? One last scripture here. Well, I'll just mention this one and we'll, well, you can look it up in 1 Chronicles chapter 12. David's about to become king and there are men who are choosing sides between King Saul and King David. You see, loyalty sometimes doesn't have to make sense. And sometimes you have to choose where God is over your natural. See, our natural sense says, you know, we grew up in this church or this tradition or we grew up in this religion or we grew up in this way. And the natural inclination, the pressure from family, the pressure from other people, the pressure from situations will say it's much safer, easier. This is the path of least resistance. This is the path, you know, follow your tradition, follow what your grandparents did, your parents, your great-grandparents, going back many generations. That's the natural inclination that will be on pressurizing all of our lives. But then there's another side where God is intervening. Where you sense, you know what? I know my family's never been to a church like that, but you know what? I feel the presence of God when I worship there. I sense God's moving there. I can see people get saved there. I can see God's hand involved in that church. I can see what God's doing in their midst. It doesn't have to be a church. It can be a ministry. It can be whatever it is where you discern the presence of God, the anointing of God, the covenant of God, and you sense even though your whole family may go against you, but you say, I want to join myself to where God's at. I want to, I may have to pay a price for this. It may have to be, in, it may cost me something, but I want, to, I want to join myself to where God's moving. Amen? So King David is there, and the, the people come from, the, from Benjamin, which is the king's tribe. And they come across to King David, and they say, you know what? David, we want to be with you. And David's like, listen, you're coming from the enemy's tribe. You're coming and you're coming, you know, I don't know. How do I trust you? How do I, you know, how do I know that your motive is right, that you're not just going to turn on me and, you know, and take me out? And it's interesting what happens is that I'm just going to read the scripture where um, they come to David and the captain of the, of the army says here in verse 18 of Second Chronicles chapter 12, the spirit came upon Amasai, chief of the captains. He said, We are yours, O David. We are on your side, son of Jesse. Peace, peace to you. Peace to your helpers, for your God helps you. So David received them and made them captains of the troop. You see, they discerned that God was with David. As much as their natural inclination was towards their tribe and their family, and we as believers are sometimes are going to have to make tough choices. Do we join ourselves to where God's moving? Or do we follow our natural, you know, 
what our natural pressure of our families or other people, you know, are going. And sometimes we're going to have to be the ones who maybe put the first step down into a new place. And many of our families will come with us as they discern God is with us and on our side. Amen? Yes. Praise God. It's not an easy choice. And sometimes God does test our loyalties. I remember when the former Soviet Union, when they were, they were, they were you know, people were being killed because they were Christians or being imprisoned and sent to Siberia. We forget those days, but they weren't that long ago. We were in Germany when that was happening. And I remember there, there coming a, a, a true story out of Russia where, you know, it was the former Soviet Union and, and, and believers were worshiping God in a basement. And suddenly the door broke open and a bunch of Russian soldiers came in. And they put the believers up against the wall and they said, we're going to shoot you, we're going to kill you. We want to check and see, will you make a confession for your faith in Jesus Christ? And if you, if you will not and you, want to, and you want to abandon your faith, then get out of this place and leave this place right now. And the believers just began to worship God. They raised their hands. They began to sing. And they began to just put all their heart in trusting God. And the Russian soldiers lifted up and began to aim right at their hearts. And, and they, they held that for a moment. And then the Russian soldiers put their guns down. And they said, we're also believers. We want to check that there's no, there's no uh, spies in your midst. You see, God will test your loyalty. I don't know exactly how it is, but you know, we're going to be put to a test where, and it's easy when you're in a nice environment and everything's going great, but let me tell you, we're all going to face pressures in life where these forces will pull against us, where we're going to come to a place where we're going to have to choose. God is our whole heart fully yours, or are we going to compromise? Are we going to allow that ham to be sliced just a little bit? Or are we going to make sure that we stay true to you. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be added to you. We have to join ourselves where God is working to what he's doing on the earth, what he's building, where his genuine people are and where his work is happening. Lastly, Jesus talks about the shepherd and versus the hireling. There's many Christians that are, you know, they look like they're doing the job of a shepherd. But Jesus says, the shepherd's willing to give his life for something. The shepherd's got a different heart. He's got a different, he's got a different loyalty. You see, a shepherd is willing to do whatever. A shepherd's willing to go the extra mile. A shepherd's willing to, to love and to care. And so many times we reach a point where, you know, is it worth keeping on trying? Is it worth trusting? Is it worth doing, you know, going the extra mile? And Jesus makes the difference. And he says in John chapter 10, verse 11, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. A hireling is he who is not the shepherd. One who does not own the sheep does not, and sees the wolf coming, leaves the sheep and flees. The wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he's a hireling, doesn't care about the sheep. I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep. I'm known by my own. The shepherd cares. The shepherd's willing to fight, to protect, to love, and to even die for the sheep. The hireling does not care, runs from trouble, is only out for himself. And I believe God is calling all of us to develop the heart of a shepherd. It's a loyal heart. It's a vulnerable heart. It can be wounded because we always have to keep it tender. It's a heart that will always, be, always believe. It'll never quit. It'll never stop caring. It'll never stop loving. Never stop trying. When God sees that kind of heart, and remember he's looking for it, he moves into action on our behalf. So when God is searching for that heart, and He will reward it. Our last scriptures, Romans 5, talks about Jesus. This is the heart of the shepherd. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we've been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, 
we will certainly be saved through the life of His Son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. Amen. Just remember the loyalty in the heart of Jesus. It wasn't because we were that great. Remember as he's dying, they're just spitting at him. They're doing everything horrific that they've just done to him. But the heart of Jesus was so loyal to his Father, so loyal to the purposes of God. And I do say this from my own heart, that God has rebuked me. Because sometimes I've been more loyal to man than I have been to the call of God. Sometimes, you know, I've allowed that trust to sort of drift. When I started with a wholeheartedness and, you know, it begins to be easier, well, I can just solve this problem without fully trusting God. I've got the means, I've got the ability. Well, God doesn't really need my help in this situation. And God says, my heart's searching. My, I'm looking throughout the whole earth. I'll show myself strong if you'll just keep trusting in me. Keep a covenant loyalty to the living God. And He will show Himself strong. His miracles will be in your hand. He will always come through for you. He'll never leave you, never forsake you. He'll always accomplish His purposes in your life. He will test your loyalty. But let's have hearts that keep covenant loyalty with the Lord our God. Amen. Give the Lord a hand. Amen. Now, I want to just really simply tonight, there's a number of people here that maybe you've given eight rooms or seven rooms. Some of you have given nine and a half rooms. But you tonight need to give the last rooms into the hand of God. Some of you maybe have never given any rooms to Jesus. But God brought you here tonight, and He brought you into our midst here, and He, and he gave you the Word of God, and, and God's been speaking to you as you've been here. And you know that the secret to victory is giving everything to Jesus. It's not giving 50%. It's not like, well, I'll give you Saturday and Sunday, and Lord, I'll take Monday through Friday, and then, you know, it's not anything like that. It's, it's a wholehearted commitment. It doesn't mean that you're going to become, you know, a preacher tomorrow. It doesn't mean anything like that. It's more a personal decision in your heart to say, God, I'm messing up the areas of my life. And unless you're in control, unless you're at the throne of every area of my life, I'm never going to see victory. You're going to have the devil visiting you every night and you're going to fight all, all, all night and you're going to wonder why he's not helping you. You're going to wonder why you don't have victory. It's because many of you have not given all of your heart over to God. It starts with you giving everything to Him because He gave everything for you. He died to give you life. He died to give Himself. He didn't hold anything back. The Bible says He gave everything right down. He hung naked. He took every one of your sins. He took every one of your pains. He took your death. He took your hell. He went to hell in your place. He did everything. He gave everything to you. And so many times we're like, well, we just want to give you 50-50. Jesus wants us to give all or nothing. It's an all or nothing relationship with Him. And many of us, it's not a question of going to church, not a question of being good. It's not a question of that. It's have you given all of your heart and all of your life to Jesus Christ? So I'd like all of our eyes closed for a moment. And if you need prayer tonight and you know that you need to give over all of your heart, you need to give over all of your life, tonight's your night. While all of our eyes are closed, I'm just going to ask you to raise up your hand. If tonight you need prayer and you want to give all of your heart and all of your life to Jesus Christ right now, tonight, just raise up your hand wherever you are, and I'll acknowledge you. You can put your hand right down again. I see your hand. I see your hand there. Anybody else that needs to do that and make that decision tonight? I see your hand there. Anybody else that needs to do that? I see hands up in the, in the, in the, uh, in the, in the nursing mother's room. I see a number of hands at the back there. Anybody else that needs to make that decision? I see your hand back there. Anybody else that needs to make that decision tonight? Anybody else that needs to do that? God's been speaking to your heart tonight. I see all of your hands. God bless the whole family. All right, I'm just going to ask you to do one last thing. Everybody stand in the presence of God. And I'm going to ask for the privilege of personally praying for those people who raised their hand. Tonight's your night. God's going to meet you tonight. God's going to break some chains and He's going to do some things in your heart. So I'd like the personal privilege of all of those who raised their hands back in the, in the, in the nursing mother's room and, and anybody else, just if you can just step in the aisle 
And let's give them a hand as they come forward. Let's give, let's make some transaction, transaction business tonight here in the presence of God. God bless you. God bless Just this whole family. God bless you, Chris. We give every single thing. No, no rooms hidden. No rooms hidden. God bless you. Just come down and join us here. Personally, we're going to transact some business here together. God bless you. Anybody else that needs to do that, come forward tonight. Tonight's your night. God bless you. Best decision you've got ever made. Hey. Shake your hand. Let's see you. Let's see you. It's great to see young people give their hearts to Jesus. I was 12 years old. And I gave my life to him. God bless you. God bless you. Keep, keep coming forward. Anybody else, even if you didn't raise your hand, you can come and join us up front here. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Everybody in agreement together with those who are praying it up front. I want you to pray this from your heart to Jesus. Don't pray it to me. He's right here. Pray this from your heart. Say, Dear Jesus, thank you that you love me. I believe that you're the Son of God. You came to this earth. You were born as a child. You grew up to be a man. And you went to a cross. You gave everything. You died in my place. You took my sins. You took my pain. You took my addictions. You went to hell in my place. And I believe you rose from the dead. You're alive right now. You're here in this place. I ask you to forgive me. Wash my past. Cleanse me right now with your precious blood. I ask you, Jesus, take control of my future. I give all ten rooms of my life, every part of it, I give it to you. Be the Lord of my life and be my Savior. Change me right now. Come into my heart. Do a miracle inside of me. Give me the strength to serve you all the days of my life. Give my future to you. And I thank you that you love me, that I am now saved, and I'm heading for heaven. Thank you, Jesus that I belong to you and you belong to me. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give the Lord a hand, amen. God bless you guys. Best decision you ever made. You know what, we have um, Pastor Joel over here and um, we're just gonna just take a few minutes with you, just give you some free literature, introduce you to a program that will help you get strong and just in, help you get a Bible if you don't have one. And um, just take a few minutes with him, and he'll help you get some things. To, what do you do next, and how do you make sure that what you don't go back to where you were before? So if you can just turn to your left, to my right, and follow Pastor Joel. God bless you. Let's give him a hand. Amen. Thank you so much. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow, you repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven, as well as upon the earth, that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. 
Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.